We've been talking a lot about life change and, and these 10 steps that we needed to take for life change. And over the course of that time, we, we talked about needing to consider your ways, to really sit down and say, God, am I following your path that you've set for me? We talked about changing your direction. That sometimes, man, we get going the wrong direction and we need to turn around and head the other direction, head God's way. We, we talked about connecting with Christ. Folks, I don't want you to connect with me necessarily. I don't want you to connect with the church. I want you to connect with Christ. And so we, we talked about all of those things. We're, we're not looking to connect with creeds. We're not looking to connect with commandments. We're not looking to connect with ceremonies. We're looking to connect with Jesus. We, we talked about ceasing your struggles. Remember the pool? We talked about ceasing your struggles. We, we, there was a variety of things we talked about in those four weeks that led to those ten steps. We talked about cultivating the quiet time. And as busy as things are in our lives, you're going to have to have some quiet time. You're going to have to have some alone time that you can listen to God if you truly want life change. Now, all of those messages are available on YouTube. All of those messages are available uh, on our Facebook page and our web page. I encourage you, if you missed some of those, go back and, and listen to them again. And if you need the notes, if you need the studies, we can provide you with those as well. That was an exceedingly practical series that we did that talked about life change. And it might not be necessary that you need all 10 steps, but there might have been two or three of those steps that were really important. Because no matter what anybody else tells you, you only have two choices in life. That's it. You have two choices in life. You're either going to walk down the way that God has set in front of us, or you're going to walk not the way. Those are the only two choices that we have. The way and not the way. And when we head down a path that is not the way, that path always ends in death. It may not be today, it may not be next week, it may not be next month. It may be five or ten years down the road. But if you're not walking the path that God has set before us, if you are on not the way, it always ends in death. Always. There's no other possibility, there's no other choices, there's no other end. But when we walk the path that God has for us, when we're on the way, Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And so when you're walking on the way, it always leads to life. And so what we're going to do a little bit today is give you a little bit more of a clue on how to walk in the way and how to live in faith. Now I want to stop before we go any further and give you an understanding that this message has the possibility to create guilt, shame, and condemnation. Because the devil's going to come in as we're sharing this message, and he's going to get questions like, well, why wasn't Aunt Mabel healed? Why did Uncle Bill get sick? And he's going to create these questions. Well, this guy is telling you that the way that God has us on leads to life. But all of these different things happen. Why did those things happen? I don't want you to focus in there. We're going to focus on what the Word says. So the devil may come in and try to bring guilt, shame, and condemnation. You can walk out of here with that today, knowing it's from him, knowing guilt, shame, and condemnation is never from God. Or you can walk out of here today with incredible excitement. Wow, God has given me a path. God has given me a way. And maybe the reason that we didn't see results before was because we didn't understand completely what that is. Now, I'll be real honest with you. I don't understand completely what that is. I've been a pastor for about 25 years, and I'm continuing to learn each and every day. Remember, the only two things that keep us from life, there's only two things that keep us from life. Hosea 4 and Ephesians 4, a lack of knowledge and unbelief. Those are the two things. So when the devil comes in and tries to say, well, Aunt Mabel, she got sick, she died. And he's going to try to get your focus off of what the Word says. 
So the reason we may not have seen results in the past may have been we had a lack of knowledge. And it may have been we had that knowledge, but we had some unbelief sprinkled in there. So I want you to open your hearts today. Open your minds. I want you to see what the Word says. And if the devil kind of tries to sneak in there with guilt, shame, and condemnation, just tell him to leave. He's not welcome there. He's not welcome here. He's not welcome in your life. And you have been given authority over all of the ability of the enemy. So if you start to get some of those feelings, shut them down. And look to the excitement that God's got for you individually today through the power of his word. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We thank you, Father, for open hearts and open minds. We thank you for the opportunity to see your word in a way we have never seen it before. We look for the opportunity, Father, to get results. Your word is true. And your word works. So, Father, thank you for letting us see that in a way we've never seen it before. And to walk out of here with a new understanding of who you are and how good you are. And a new understanding of what you want us to do in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in the Bible, God gives us a very simple prescription on how to live life. Four different times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God tells us how to live. And very simply, God just says, the righteous will live by faith. Say that with me. The righteous will live by faith. One more time. The righteous will live by faith. So that is a prescription that God gives us for success. Now I want you to look at the words when we talk about this word live. In the Hebrew, it is the word hayah. Look at the definition for hayah. It means to live prosperously, to restore life and health, and to revive from sickness and discouragement. So in the Old Testament, we see that when we live by faith, that's the results of living by faith. Is to live prosperously, to revive from sickness and discouragement, and to restore life and health. Now, the other three verses were in the New Testament. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 3. No one is justified or made righteous. No one is justified or made righteous by the, by the law. No one. There is not a single person who can be made righteous or justified by the law. It is absolutely impossible. But the righteous shall live by faith. Now, in the New Testament, in Greek, it's the word zao, derivative of zoe, which you're familiar with. And zao means to enjoy real life, to have true life, to be active and blessed, to have full vigor, to be strong, efficient, and powerful. Anybody want the results of either one of those two things? Okay. So God gives us the prescription. God says, when you live by faith, this will be the results of that. Very simple prescription. Now, we talked last week, how do we become righteous? And it's not by our behavior. Isaiah 64 says, all our righteousnesses, it's, it is plural. God says, every good thing we do is like a filthy rag. Love that verse, because it doesn't say all of our sins. It says all of our righteousness. All of the good things that you and I might try to do to become righteous are like a filthy rag. It does not work. And God says the only way that we become righteous, now righteousness is a condition acceptable to God, the only way that we become righteous is to believe in Jesus Christ. Period. There's no other option. So when we see these four verses that says the righteous shall live by faith, guess what? It's talking about all believers. All believers. I, I, I should be able to preach this message in any church in town, in any church in this state, in any church in the world. 
I should be able to preach this message. Why? Because when it says the righteous shall live by faith, he's talking about all believers. He's not talking about Methodists. He's not talking about Lutherans. He's not talking about Catholics. He's saying that if you are righteous by your belief in Jesus Christ, then you should live by faith. So God says, there's a prescription that I've given you, and this prescription for success and for results and for health is to live by faith. Now, when you get a prescription, there are directions in certain ways to take that prescription, right? Sometimes it might say, take this medicine in the morning. Sometimes it might say, take this medicine in the evening. Sometimes it might say, take this medicine with food. Sometimes it might say, don't take this medicine with food. But there are directions to that particular prescription. And if you follow those directions, you'll get results. Now, when you take a prescription, most of the time, you don't get the results right away. Sometimes you start feeling better, maybe even within 24 hours. But generally, it's going to take some time for that prescription to work. So there is the way to take that prescription. But there is also not the way to take that prescription. Right? I don't go and say, well, I got 20 pills in here. The best thing for me to do is take all 20 of these pills right away and I'll feel better instantly. That's not the way. That could be dangerous. It's also not the way, if this prescription says take one pill a day, it's not a good idea to take one pill a month. You're probably not going to get very good results by doing it that way. And when you get a prescription, what's the thing that they do before they let you out of hy V or Brothers or wherever they're going to get a prescription? They do a consult. And the pharmacist comes up and says, do you have any questions about this prescription? This is the way that you need to take this prescription. It needs to be taken with milk. It needs to be taken in the morning. Don't take it with water. Don't take it with Dr. Pepper. Don't take it before you go to bed at night. Okay? So if we want results from the prescription, then we need to do it the way that the doctor or the pharmacist tells us. Amen? So God has given us a prescription on how to live life. He says if you are righteous, then you should live by faith. And when you live by faith, these are the results that you get. Now, that doesn't really help us unless we know what faith is, right? So I can tell you to live by faith, but if I don't tell you what faith is, it really doesn't do much good. So let's go to probably one of the best verses that talks about living by faith and what faith is. And it's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1. 1. I'm going to read to you four different translations of that and see if you can figure out what faith is. So first of all, in the New King James, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not completely clear yet, is it? So let's go to the New Living Translation. It is the confidence that what we hope will actually happen. It is the assurance of what we can't see. Now that might be a little bit more helpful for you. In the Christian Standard Bible, it is the reality of what is hoped for. It is the proof of what is not seen. Real similar to the New King James. And in the Amplified, the Amplified says that faith is the title deed. Faith is the divinely guaranteed promise. Faith is a fact that can't be experienced by physical senses. Got it? So now that you know what faith is, now you can live by it. See you later. Have a great Sunday. <laughs> 
doesn't quite work that way, does it? So we can, we can know we're supposed to live by faith. We can have an idea of what the Bible says that faith is. But we might need to step back. We might need a few more pieces to this puzzle before we can figure out what it means to live by faith. So we might want to find out, well, how does faith come? And I would take you to Romans chapter 10, where the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So faith comes by the Word. Are you still with me? So faith comes by the Word. Now we know from John 1 that Jesus is the Word. So faith comes also from hearing messages about Jesus. Because Jesus is the Word. And the Word is Jesus. So we can see what faith is. We can understand that we're supposed to live by faith. And here in this verse, now we see that faith comes by the Word. Are you with me to this point? Faith comes by the Word. Now, Statista is a group that does a lot of surveys. And Statista recently did a study about Bible reading. And they found that, not Christians, but 34% of Americans have never read a Bible. 34% of Americans have never read a Bible. That is shocking. 34% of Americans have never read a Bible. Now, the millennial generation was the largest group of people in America who have never read a Bible. Out of that 34%, the millennials was the largest group of people. Now, I love this, <laughs> I love this particular statistic. 12% read their Bibles less than once a year. How do you do that? You read it once every two years, so that means you read it less than once a year. So 12% of Americans read their Bible less than once a year. 11% of Americans read their Bible once or twice a year. A year. So you tell me, if faith comes by the word, is that group of people going to be strong in faith? No. And here was an interesting statistic from this same study. I actually thought it would be the other way around. But in 2018, they said 16% of Americans read their Bible daily. In 2020, that had fallen to 3%. Now, I would have thought that with all that was going on in our world last year, that more people would have picked up their Bible and read it. But in 2020, only 3% of Americans read their Bible daily. What's the statistic for Christians? 19%. 19% of Christians read their Bible daily. That's like saying 80% of us don't breathe. 80% of us don't eat. 80% of us don't live. Because if you're not reading your Bible, it's really going to be hard to live. Faith comes by the Word, and if there's no Word, there's no faith. No guilt, shame, or condemnation, right? But excitement to know that God has given us a prescription that works. And a prescription that the righteous are supposed to live by. And when the righteous live by this prescription, what happens? We will live prosperly. It will restore life and health. We will have true life, be active, blessed, etc., etc. So that should create some incredible excitement to know that I'm not stuck. I don't have to stay in this place. I'm not enjoying true life. I'm not enjoying a life blessed. I'm not enjoying a life full of vigor. I'm not enjoying a life that's prosperous and full of health. Well, guess what? You can. That should create tremendous excitement that I'm not stuck in this place. That God has given me a prescription that I can get out of. 
when you had that sickness or disease and they gave you a prescription, you can look at that and say, man, it's not always going to be like this. Why? Because God has given me a prescription on the way out. But many of us turn to the world. And for many of us, our center is education. Our center is the government. Our center is medicine. Look at what Jeremiah 9 says. We live in a world of deception. <laughs> you think you can trust anything that's coming from the world right now? Anything that's coming from our media? Anything that's coming from our government? Anything that comes from the areas of education or medicine? Why? We live in a world of deception. Why is there deception? Because the world refuses to know Jesus. That's why they live in a world of deception. The wisdom of the world is foolishness, folks. It's foolishness. And their thoughts are futile. And yet so many of us turn instantly to the world when something happens. We want to find out what the world has to say about this particular issue in my life. Folks, if we're going to learn how to live, and if we're going to learn how to live by faith, your center needs to be Jesus Christ. <laughs> there is no other way to live. In, in the midst of everything that's going on in our world, man, I don't know how people hang on without Jesus as their center. Because I'll just be real brutally honest with you, it can be tough sometimes even when Jesus is your center. So I don't know how people cope without Jesus in the center of their life. And so faith comes by the Word. Faith comes when we are in the Word. Guess what comes when we are not? Fear. Fear comes from the world. Fear comes when you are not in the Word. Do you know both faith and fear work? I want to be very clear about that. Faith and fear both work. Look at Job chapter 3. The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has come true. Fear works. Fear works. Let me read it to you again. What I always feared has happened. What I dreaded has come true. What, what are you surrounding yourself with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? And what kind of words are they speaking? If you're being surrounded by people that are speaking fear, if you're watching the news all day and it's creating fear, you better pay attention to this verse. Now on the flip side of that, on the encouraging side of that, on the exciting side of that, Matthew chapter 9, let it be done according to your faith. That's good news. I don't have to stay stuck in fear. I don't have to let the things that fear wants to bring into my life to come into my life. And boy, let me tell you, they will try to come into your life every single day. Every single minute, every single hour, fear is trying to get a hold of your heart. The devil brings fear. God brings faith. You will choose which one you're going to live by. Living by faith is living by the Word. Living by faith is living by the Word because faith comes by the Word. It is the evidence. It is the proof. It is the reality of things that we don't yet see. And folks, if you find confirmation in the word of your healing of your deliverance of your joy of your peace it's yours one amen if you find evidence in the word of your healing of your deliverance of your prosperity of your peace of your joy it's yours amen. better amen means so be it in my life Amen. I recently purchased some new golf clubs from Shields. And when I purchased these golf clubs, they provided me with a receipt. 
and the receipt or the title deed for those golf clubs was mine. Now, when I went down to get those from Shields, they only had one of them in stock. So I was only able to come home with one of them. This receipt entitled me to this particular club, and I was able to take it home immediately because of this receipt. But you know what? There were a couple of other clubs that I ordered that day that I didn't get to take home. They didn't have them in stock. They had to be shipped to me from somewhere else. And you know what? I didn't know when they were coming. I didn't even know where they were coming from. But guess what? I knew they were mine. Because I had the title deed. I had the receipt to that. So, what do you need? Find it in here. And when you find it in here, this is your title deed. This is your receipt. That even if you don't see it, even if you don't have it in your hands right now, even if it isn't a reality in your life right now, this is the proof that it is yours. So let's look back at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 again, which says, Faith is the reality, is the proof. Okay, now we've said that faith is the word, right? Faith comes by the word. So flip this thing around. The word is the reality of what is hoped for. And the word is the proof of things not seen. Amplified, the word is the title deed. The word says that it is divinely guaranteed. The word says that it is a fact but it cannot be experienced by physical senses. This is your title deed. This is your proof. And living by faith is living by the Word. So what happens when trouble comes? What happens when something enters in your life that you weren't expecting, something enters in your life that's not good? Whether it's a sickness whether it's a relationship with you, whether it's a financial issue, folks, your first move should be to find the evidence in this word of what you need. When trouble comes, your first move should be to go to this word and find the evidence of what you need and the evidence of what is already yours. What would I have done if Shields would have called me and said, Mr. Ganahl, we have no proof that these other two clubs are yours. We have no proof that you have ever paid for them. We have no proof, we have no records that we need to give you those clubs. Now, do you not think that that's what the devil is doing to you every single day? There's no proof of your healing. There's no proof of your good relationships. There's no proof of your financial prosperity. There's no proof of your peace. There's no proof of your joy. He's telling you that every single day. And so when trouble comes, if Shields would have called me and said that, you know what I would have produced for them? I would have produced the receipt. I would have produced the proof and the evidence that yes, I did pay for those clubs, and yes, even though I don't have those clubs yet, those clubs are mine. So when the devil comes in and tries to say, there's no proof for your healing, there's no proof for your peace, there's no proof for your joy, go grab the receipt and shove it down his throat. What does the Bible tell us about that? The Bible tells us to hold fast to the word which we have been taught. Hold fast. I taught my kids early 
that when you purchase something, you hang on to the receipt. Because something might go wrong with that. They might not deliver that. And if you don't have the receipt, I told them, when you go to the bank and you make a deposit in the bank and they give you a receipt, you hang on to that until you have proof in your statement that it's there. More than once, that has been a benefit and a blessing. So you hold fast to this word that you have been taught. You hold fast to the confession of your faith. Confession, homologio in Greek, it means to say the same thing as, it means to not refuse or deny. So if I'm holding fast to this receipt, and I'm talking to Shields, guess what I'm doing? I'm holding fast to the confession. I'm saying the same thing that this receipt says. Those clubs are mine. When you're holding fast to the truth about your peace or your joy, you are holding fast to what God has said in his word, and you're going to say the same thing as God says in his word, and you are not going to refuse or deny that. Amen? So I'm holding tight onto this. I am not letting this go. I have, I have an envelope in my desk full of important receipts. And when I buy something and purchase something that might be a little bit more expensive than your average thing, I'm hanging on to the receipt. Because I want proof and I want the evidence that that thing is mine. And so for you, the devil's going to come and try to convince you you don't got it and you've got to produce the receipt. And you know what? These are fully paid for. You know what? Everything you need is fully paid for. Absolutely everything that you need is fully paid for. Faith comes by the word. And so the righteous live by the word. The righteous live by the word. What does it say? Not what do you think, not what do you feel, not what do you see. Well, I feel like they're not going to give me these clubs. I don't see these clubs. Maybe, maybe I just think that, that the kid took my money and he didn't put the order in. No. What does it say? What does it say? And so I'm going to hang on to that, and that's going to be my confession. And so for the word, what does it say? Now remember, faith is a noun, right? Faith is always a noun. Faith is not an action. So faith is the place that we go to learn to live by faith. Now the place that we go to learn to live by faith is what? The word. So faith is a noun. So if I'm going to live by faith, I'm going to live by the word. It's the place that I go to learn to live by faith. I go to the word. Now belief, belief and faith, pistis and pistuo in Greek, they are, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. They're very similar. But belief is the verb. So I go to this place of faith. I go to the Word. That's the place that I go to. Jesus is the Word. I go to Jesus. I go to Jesus. I go to the Word. That's the place that I go to live by faith. But when I get there, there is a corresponding action that comes with it. And that's what belief is. Now here's the issue. When we became a New Covenant church back in 2011, we began to preach the message of grace, the pure, unadulterated message of the gospel of grace. There's two things that happen with grace. Two misconceptions. Number one, the first misconception about grace is, wow, I'm under grace, I'm completely forgiven, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and sin as much as I want. That's the first misconception about grace. That is absolutely not true. Romans 6. Paul says... I'm under grace, so should I continue to live in sin? Absolutely not. First misconception. Second misconception about grace is, wow, I don't have to do anything. That is a misconception. There is a corresponding action to our faith. 
So we go to the place of faith. We go to the place of faith. We go to the word. And then there is a corresponding action to that. And I've given you five examples in the word. Let me show you what this means. So the devil is coming at you and he's screaming at you. He's saying, your kids aren't going to be protected. Your kids are making a mess of their lives. Your kids are going to get sick. Your kids are going to die. He's screaming at you for some financial things. He's screaming at you for the condition of the world. So you need to silence him. You need to silence your enemy. Everybody, anybody ever felt like that? The devil's screaming in your ear all the time? Okay, so what do I do? I go to my place of faith. I go to the Word. And then there is a corresponding action that needs to happen. In this case, one of the corresponding actions could be Psalm 8 and Matthew 21. Praise is the weapon that silences the enemy. So my corresponding action, if I believe in this word, my corresponding action to silence the enemy from my life is praise. Are you with me? So I just can't go, oh, oh I'm at the place of faith. I see these scriptures in the word. Oh, who cares? No, there is a corresponding action to that place that I just went to. Let me give you another one. Let's say you're struggling with health, struggling with sickness. So I go to the place, I go to the Word, I go to where I'm supposed to live, and I find Proverbs chapter 4. And Proverbs chapter 4 tells me, and it's not up here, it's in your notes. We couldn't get them all up here. Let's go look at Proverbs chapter 4 in your notes. I'm going to have to pay attention to God's words. I'm going to have to listen to God's words. I'm not going to... I'm not supposed to lose sight of God's word, and I'm supposed to keep those words in my heart, and that will bring life and health to my whole body. So that's one corresponding action when I'm sick. Is the word in front of me? <laughs> Am I protecting those words in my heart? Let's say you're broke. You're as broke as the Ten Commandments, and you need God to help you in that particular... Well, that was pretty good. Come on, give me some love. Right, Jerry? That wasn't... It's a little too quick. You're as broke as the Ten Commandments. It still didn't go over. Okay. You're as broke as the Ten Commandments. And so you need to know how to live. And so what do you do? I'm going to the place of faith. I'm going to the Word. And what's it say in Luke chapter 6? Give, and it will be given to you. So my corresponding action... If I'm going to believe and live by faith, there's a corresponding action to what the Word says. And if you're broke, what's it say? Give. Now the world would tell you that's foolish. But we've also already established that the wisdom of the world is foolishness. It's futile. It's deceptive. So if you're dealing with these issues in your life, if you're dealing with these problems... You've got to go to the place of faith. You've got to go to the Word, and when you get to the Word, and you find that issue in the Word, and you find your receipt in your title deed, there will be a corresponding action of belief to bring that to pass. Amen? And you know what else we have to do? We have to start speaking even before we receive it. See, when I left Shields that day and I had purchased those clubs and I had the receipt even though I didn't have the other clubs in the set I was calling my son I was calling my brother and you know what I was telling them I got new golf clubs guess what I didn't have new golf clubs yet but I had the receipt I had the proof I didn't know when they were coming I didn't know where they were coming from. But guess what? I was speaking something into existence that did not yet exist. Amen? I didn't have them yet. But because I had the receipt and because I had the proof that those things were mine, even though I didn't know when, even though I didn't know from where, I could talk about these clubs as though they were mine. 
because I had the title deed. <laughs> I had the proof that they were mine. So what are you speaking? Most of the time, the corresponding action to the word is to speak. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We're going to call these things into existence even though they don't yet exist. 2 Corinthians 4, we have the same spirit of faith with what is written. We have the same spirit of faith with what is written. They believed and spoke. We also believe and speak. We also believe and speak. So even before I touched those clubs, even before those clubs made it to my house, I was telling people I had new golf clubs. And I was telling people I had new golf clubs because I had the proof that I had new golf clubs. I had a receipt. I had a title deed. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you look through your physical eyes at this world, you will always live in fear. If you look through your physical eyes at the things in the world, you will always be in fear. They had come and surrounded Elisha and surrounded his servant, and they were going to kill them. And Elisha's servant said, Master, what do we do? And Elisha prayed, Father, open his eyes and let him see. Now, was he blind? No, because he saw with his physical eyes the army that surrounded them and was going to kill them. And so he was in great fear. And Elisha prayed, Father, open his spiritual eyes that he might see. And when Elisha prayed that, guess what the servant saw? chariots of fire surrounding the army that had come against Elisha, filled with angels. So we got to stop seeing with our physical eyes. And you have to start seeing with your spiritual eyes. You have to start living by faith. And when we live by faith, we live by the Word. Because faith comes by the word. 2 Corinthians 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, just take what you learned today. We walk by the word and not by sight. I walk by what that word says and what that word has promised me, not what I see with my physical eyes. Even if we are unfaithful, God is faithful. And so what it comes back down to is, do you see in the Word what you need? And as you see it in the Word, are you going to begin to speak and take the corresponding action of belief according to what you see in the Word? Look what God says in 1 Corinthians 1 as we close this up. God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things which are. There are things which are not in your life right now. That might be peace. That might be joy. That might be relationships. That might be finances. That might be health. So God has chosen the things which are not yet, the things which he has promised us in there, to come in and replace the things which are. And we do that by living our life by faith. We do that by living our life by the word. Amen? Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the chance to come and learn more about your way for us. I pray that the words that were planted would go deep in our heart and produce a harvest 30, 60, 100-fold in all of our lives. And we just praise and worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday.